In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, we plan on completing this study uh, next week. Chapter 22, the last chapter in the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 21, in verse 1, and we read, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Uh, now, what does that mean? Well, it may mean the same thing that Peter discusses in 2 Peter 3 and verse 11. Uh, a lot of people feel that it does. And I'll read that to you. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. And Peter said, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to this promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, that's what we just read about in Revelation, new heavens and a new earth. And according to uh, uh, Peter, that this is a uh, uh, something uniquely new in that the old one dissolves or burns up with fire. And we uh, get a new uh, formation out of the old elements. Now the reason I say a new formation out of these old elements, the Greek word here for new is kainos. And kainos does not make reference to what we sometimes call uh, creation ex nihilo, that is out of nothing. It addresses something that is reformed in some way. That's the the way uh, kainos uh, is to be understood. So when um, Peter and John here talks about a new heaven and a new earth, he's implying that God's working with some existing stuff, you say, and that is in harmony, I think, with the scriptures, whereas the first uh, creation, there was no existing stuff. You know, evolution always talking about you know, creating things out of a test tube, you know, but uh, uh, or from the dirt of the ground. And uh, the problem is, you know, they don't go get their own dirt. They get God's dirt, <laughs> you know, to start this process. And God called it all into existence with a spoken word. And now, at this date, at the end of time, uh, it's going to experience a new formation. <coughs> and we often think about the scarring that the earth experiences because of man's sin, and, and it does. Uh, I realize there's political agendas that magnify that beyond what it would be proper, but nevertheless, man uh, in his... Uh, sinful application of the command to subdue the earth and, and have dominion over it, uh, he goes beyond God's intent to be a good steward of God's creation and instead, of course, seeks to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, everything he can at the expense of any given generation, so I, just so I can get mine, so to speak, and move on, leaving behind him the, the scarring of God's creation. Well, we are called to be good stewards. And uh, that's why Christians have uh, always, I think, been uh, re responsive to the call of uh, conservation and such like. But the uh, problem is, a lot of that movement's been taken over uh, by uh, those with a different theological and political agenda. Uh, so that... Uh, <coughs> You lose your enthusiasm for some of it as a result. But we do have a new heaven and a new earth at this time. And uh, it appears to, 
that this comes out of this uh, dissolved universe, which is then made. Now, there's so many things that crosses one's mind. I don't have time to discuss it at things like this. And that would be, uh, how big is this new earth? You know? Uh, you know, we've got 7 billion people living on it today. It seems to be adequate for that amount and more. Uh, but, uh, you know, the new earth, will it be the same size? As we, will it be, you know, a thousand times bigger? I don't think it, you know, whatever it is, you, you, you always come back to the fact, it suits God's divine purpose in however he creates it. But one thing is certain, we're going back in some sense to paradise in this new heaven and new earth. That condition in which Adam and Eve lived and saw, nobody ever lived and saw after them because an angel barred the entrance. It existed apparently for some considerable amount of time, maybe to the flood. And men were barred from, you know, sneaking a peek and seeing what it's like in there. Uh, and it was done away with in the flood. We're going to go back to a Garden of Eden existence. And we can't hardly even imagine that. I would say we were going to go beyond that. And the reason I say that, Jesus said, I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, in fact, man, you and I and others, we actually have rather fertile imaginations. They can imagine some fantastic things. And yet, the implication of what Jesus says, you can't even scratch the surface. Your imagination, as great as you think it is, you can't scratch the surface what I have for you in heaven. And so that's apparently a pretty awesome thing. And I might add that as material beings, our heaven is a material world. It is this new heaven and new earth under discussion. We will live in resurrected bodies in a world, uh, a paradise, if you will. And that is the, um, the goal to which we move in history toward that end. Any questions about that? Some people think, uh, you know, we sort of float around in a bodiless state or something in heaven. There is a bodiless state, obviously, for those who are uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord in death. And, but it's an imperfect state. And, and, and one in which we, in, in some sense, feel unclothed and in which we will one day be clothed uh, with resurrected bodies in which we'll be comfortable because we're made to be comfortable in uh, these bodies. But they'll be perfect bodies. You'll see people walking up to you and have a take a look at you and say, is that you? You're looking good. <laughs> and, uh, and that way true. We will indeed be looking good in those resurrected bodies. And he said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, <clears throat> God is going to be living on this earth with us in some sense. He is going to be dwelling here. And this holy city, which we will learn in a few minutes, is basically a 1,500-mile cube, 1,500 miles long, wide, high. Now, I think most probably this is just symbolic language. I mean, it's not impossible on, on a new heaven and a new earth. We think, well, outer space is 100 miles. Well, who knows what it is, it, you know. Who knows whether we'll breathe oxygen. I don't know what, what it's going to be like. Uh, but I still uh, suspect this is symbolic because it is an absolute cube. And I would draw to your attention that the Holy of Holies was an absolute cube in the temple. Tabernacle. I think God is telling us that we uh, eternally enter into the Holy of Holies, into the most intimate uh, presence with God himself forever. The barriers have been broken down in Christ, and uh, he is going to dwell. His Holy of Holies is going to be right here on earth. Now, whether we live, I heard one fellow describe it as a 15 hundred uh, you know, mile cube tenement complex and he was trying to say that doesn't sound attractive to me I want to live out by the lake someplace 
and his point is well taken. Uh, but nevertheless, whether we have an in-town townhouse or an out-of-town lake house, it's just going to be amazing, you know. And probably we'll have all of that, you know. Uh, I would say we'd have one down by the, uh, you know, the ocean. But if uh, we really a bit more, there's no sea, <laughs> you say. Uh, and that's going to be unique because life as we know it cannot exist without massive amounts of water. And that's why they keep hunting for water. And uh, they say, uh, well, with our tax dollars, uh, trying to uh, establish that there, hopefully there is a life someplace else, which, you know, gets them out of the context of this unique creation of God, which they hate. And uh, would, would seek to believe that, you know, uh, such worlds as ours are common. In fact, there's nothing common about uh, the world in so many different ways. It's astronomically impossible, I think, for another world to exist, except by you know, the divine providence of God. And the Bible doesn't talk about another world. It talks about the recreation of this one. You see, I think implying there is no other. Uh, and uh, heavens and earth, and outer space, in some sense, I think, they become, continues to be a part of man's Habitation, but in a you know a, a unique way with the with the new heaven, the new earth, the new bodies. What that way that might be, I don't know. I know he's you know traveling there now. He may continue to do so under the providence of God, uh, just to uh, you know allow man to grow and expand and to be excited about God's creation. And uh, the interesting thing is. In terms of the limitation of our senses, outer space has no end. In fact, it does. You say, what's on the other side? What does it look like? I don't know. I know one thing. Only God is eternally expansive. And no created thing is. And the, and the universe is a created thing. Before it came into existence, God was. And whatever else was, I don't know. But I just know that the universe is not God. The universe is created by God and has its limits. We may never expand those limits through all of eternity. We may cease, you know, and never be able to uh, find the ends of God's creation just because he's God and that's the type of thing he can create. But uh, another fascinating thing about creation, this thing that's so big, so much bigger than the world as we know it, is that God discusses it in the book of uh, Genesis with one simple <laughs> uh, phrase that just it takes your breath away because of its simplicity. He created the heavens also. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you know? What a simple statement for something so incredibly uh, immense. Um, so, God comes and dwells with us. Uh, we are the bride. He is the husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. God condescends to do that. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That is a formulaic statement common to the Old Testament. Over and over and over again, and, but, this, and, but in this time, in its most absolute sense, that we are not simply a people as Israel or as a church, but we are something even uniquely beyond that. God is dwelling, not theologically, so to speak, uh, uh, spiritually, emotionally. God's dwelling amongst man, physically. Now, not the Father, we cannot see him, he's without form, but the Son. God the Son will walk and talk amongst us as he did in uh, Israel 2,000 years ago. Questions as I go. Interrupt, if you would. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I find myself going back to verse 4. I would recommend you remember verse 4, at least the location, so that you can go back to it all your life and remind yourself 
that the trials and the troubles and the difficulties and the heartbreak that you're experiencing, and we all do, there's nobody that gets away from it. Oh, we put up a you know, stiff upper lip when we come to church and such like, but all through the congregation, we take turns being brokenhearted for various issues and problems and reasons, death and disease and destruction and, and uh, behavioral turmoil enter our lives. And it just drives us to our knees. And to remember as often as you can, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. How many times we grieve over the grave. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning. And we mourn. Sometimes, you know, mourning is generally associated with death. And a lot of times we mourn. Nobody knows. It's just in the depth of the, our heart. We might, you know, be in any place, yeah, whether people or without people around us. And we can be deeply mourning over something that's so disturbed. It's br bringing us to tears uh, because of the difficulties of the sin cursed world in which we live in. And to remember, there will be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain for all these things, these former things have passed away. That is God's love for us. And you think about it, it'll bring you to tears, the love of God. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the springs of the water of life without payment. To, uh, the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. <clears throat> now this next verse is fascinating. We've all read it time and time again, and I dare say we've all taken it out of context. And I want to put it into context just a little bit and to allow you to think about it a little bit differently. <clears throat> as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, uh, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There's no question there's a second death. There's no, you know, some people, I don't say how they do it. hardly want to spend my time discussing it with them. Some people deny the existence of hell. Well, you know, the word hell's not used there, actually. Whatever you want to call it, you don't want to be there, you're saying. It's an eternal condition. But notice, again, let me put some of these words into context. What is the context? We've been in the first century. <clears throat> We've been discussing Jerusalem. We've been discussing its rebellion, its old Jerusalem, its old wife of Jehovah. <clears throat> and uh, we've been discussing how there was going to be a new Jerusalem, a tale of two cities, the old and the new, a tale of two brides, the wife of Jehovah and the bride of Christ, and how this is all changing, and the church is going through this crisis in this first century, uh, dealing, so to speak, with uh, the claims of Christ as being Lord of all of creation, not simply Lord of Israel, Lord of all of creation, and they're suffering for it. Some are, <clears throat> but there are cowardly in the church. You know, the church is external, is not all saved people. You know, it's one of the reasons people come to church. The cowardly, when standing before the Roman uh, magistrate and saying, is Caesar Lord or is Jesus Lord? They say Caesar's Lord. That's the cowardly. They go down. You see? The, uh, <clears throat> the faithless at the time of crisis have no faith. The detestable, uh, those who are identified by God, we don't go around using words like that, by God because of their willingness to turn their back on the things that got detested. For murderers, 
You know how Nero nearly wiped out the Church of Jesus Christ in Rome? He arrested a few Christians and tortured them until they told almost every family in the city. And almost every family in the city was arrested. And the people that gave their names were the murderers. Because untold thousands of people died at the hands, not only of Nero, at the hands of the church. You see, those who uh, were cowardly, and those who would sacrifice the lives of the church to save their own, they were nothing more than murderers. The sexually immoral, <clears throat> of course, uh, this, well, this, you know, this thing called sex is almost indescribable. And uh, the power it has uh, on human beings. People will sell their soul for it. And the church was, you know, just absolutely, the church in the early years, with, you know, if you haven't studied church history in the early years, you'd be amazed at the attitude of the church to sexual immorality. You found committing sexual immorality, you were put out of the church. There was no counseling. There was no second chance. There was no, oh dear, is there anything we can do? You were out. And later, when some of the church fathers came up with the idea, well, let's call them to repentance and allow them, if they do repent, say in the church, they were almost stoned because that was considered, you know, just, you know, what type of, uh, of moral standard is that? And now you put that in context of our, uh, you know, modern day opinions on how to deal with these things. I'm not saying you understand the church is right. I just want you to get some historical context in their attitude to the sexually immoral. There's no role for it in the church. You see what I'm trying to say? No role for it whatsoever. You got involved in it, you were out. You lived a pagan as far as they were concerned. So when, you know, you don't know their heart, you don't know their state or not. That's fine. And they didn't care. The church was not going to have that type of people in it. That's all they knew. And that's the way they handled it in the first several centuries. I know, I've read it, studied it carefully. And um, <clears throat> sorcerers, or sorcerers, of, of course, we think in terms of witchcraft and uh, fortune tellers and things of this nature, which is appropriate uh, understanding. Uh, it's the Greek word uh, pharmacology. And, uh, and you say, well, how do you translate pharmacology? Should, shouldn't you translate that like, like drugs? Uh, why is it translated saucers? Well, because of the context of the fact that the saucers, the witches, you know, the wizards, the uh, fortune tellers, they were all involved in mixing potions, you know, love potions, hate potions, this potion, that potion, power from the potion, so to speak. And so the potion itself, you know, took on the, the meaning of the whole industry, the whole witchcraft industry. And so uh, it's like, and again, Washington, D.C. says such and such. But you take a part for the whole. This is, the, you know, uh, part of their activity was mixing potions, but it was addressed to the whole. And it's the witchcraft, the saucers, the fortune tellers, no role in the kingdom of God. That was anathema uh, to uh, Jews. You do realize, I guess, that there are Christians who go to fortune tellers. You know, first time I heard that, I was shocked. You know, they don't trust the sovereign God to, to, you know, spell out whatever their fortune might be, good or bad. Time, always good in eternity. And the fact is, God hates fortune tellers. And it's just amazing that Christians would do things like, should not. Idolaters. Anything that Love more than Christ, as Jim was preaching today, is an idolatry. All liars. What's the, what's the greatest of all liars in this first century context? And that would be Caesar is Lord. No, it's a lie. Jesus is Lord. So I'm trying to put this in a first century context in some way. And it's limited by our understanding of that first century. But I think this passage is better understood as what the Christians were going through. Uh, during this period, and how they were
were suffering and how we just get through discussing the news wrestling for the family of God and those people that persecuted and murdered you and killed you and did this to you, let me tell you where they're going. One is going to heaven, the new heaven and new earth, the other is going to the lake of fire. And who qualifies for the lake of fire? Those who are enemies of the church of Jesus Christ. I think that's what's being said here. And he goes on to describe with more detail, and it's, it's John's character to use cycles of description, ex expansive uh, the second and third time around. Now he's talking about the New Jerusalem a little bit more here. And here's where he gives us his size, and it's the precious stones, the gold, clear as crystal. No such gold exists in this world, but in the world to come there will be. And, um, and he gives us the size, as I discussed, the size of the Holy of Holies. Tells us about the wall. And, uh, uh, excuse me, before I get to there. He tells us that the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel are inscribed on the, uh, the gates. And then he says, uh, that's in verse 12, then he says in verse 14, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb are inscribed on the 12 foundations. What do you have here that utterly solves, you know, answers the question of what does the family of God consist? It consists of Old Testament Israel, and a New Testament church. They're one community of faith. Do you see that right here? Those that would separate them out. You know, I'm talking about dispensationalism. They have their own, you know, spiritual agenda, which is really the higher agenda, according to dispensationalists. Their material kingdom of, you know, David on this earth. The church is taken out of the way so they might not, you know, intermingle between this crowd. And you have two different judgments and two different destinies. No. No. It's not found in the Bible. The Bible calls the church of Jesus Christ the Israel of God. And right here in the eternal condition, there's not a place, you know, for the Jews and another place for the church. It's one community of faith, not only in time but in eternity. And it's important to see that right here in this passage. Any questions about that? Verse 17 talks about its wall, 144 cubits high, about 200, 210 feet. That's a high wall, except for one thing. This city is 1,500 miles, 1,300, 1,500 miles tall. That's, you know, <laughs> that's so small it's indescribable in terms of proportion. If you are proportionately describing something, you would have a wall nearly as high as the city because every city in the ancient world had a wall. The buildings in that city weren't hardly any higher than the wall, you see. And the, I think the tallest wall we know anything about, we haven't seen it, but read about it, is actually a wall that went around Babylon, which was about 200 feet tall. And it was wide enough that two chariots could go back and forth without hitting each other. So I don't know what that is, 20 or 30 feet wide. That's a pretty substantial wall. Uh, of course, they just went right under the river. I could have taken that city. That wall didn't do a bit of good. But uh, it's a wall about like this. The size of the wall is insignificant here. Just like I think the 12,000 stadia for the size of the city. We're talking 12. Yeah. That's a significant number in scripture. You're talking thousand, which magnifies something from its common to something uniquely uncommon. We're talking about, you know, the absolute utter holy of holies of God. <clears throat> and a wall is for what? It's for protection. <clears throat> the point is, <clears throat> this perfect city has a perfect protection system around it. Remember the 144,000? <clears> that and why was 144,000 used? Because they were protected, you see. They received the mark of God. They escaped from Jerusalem. And it was designed, just the use of the term, to send a message. Oh, the protected group. Got it. Oh, the protected city. Got it. One that, you know, is in no danger of ever being uh, entered improperly. 
although the gate to the city stay open 24 hours a day. <laughs> There's no enemy. <laughs> uh, but it's symbolic of it, the, uh, you know, the role that it plays there. And I saw, verse 22, no temple in the city, for his temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. So, uh, this new Jerusalem doesn't have a temple like the old Jerusalem did. It said God simply dwells there, and he himself is the temple, and uh, there's no uh, special place of worship. There is a person of worship instead of a place of worship, and he who dwells in the city with us. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it its light. Well, you remember the first creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. But there were no light bearers for several days. I think it was the fourth day, you correct me if I'm wrong, in which God created the sun and the moon and the stars. So there was light in the first creation for three days without sun and moon and stars. There will be no sun and moon and stars and the, uh, I don't think, it didn't say stars, there will be no sun and moon, uh, but there will be light, and there will be light around the globe, not just in one, you know, place, as the earth turns uh, and moves around the sun. We will have light 24 hours a day. That implies no sleeping, and that also implies we don't get fatigued and tired and need sleep. In the, in the new, in the new para, paradise of God. We enjoy it 24 hours a day, 24-7, uh, without interruption. And uh, <clears throat> gates will never be shut. Uh, there will be no night. And uh, verse 27, but, but nothing unclean will ever enter at or anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. A limited citizenship, the family of God, those written in the Lamb's book of life, that book was created before the foundation of the world. And so we get the complexity, and what is there not about God that's complex, after all he's God. Uh, we get the complexity of this thing called election and salvation. And nobody can enter the city unless the name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And, but that was established before the first brick was laid, so to speak. You were talking about the relationship between the church and Israel. And then I see the thing about the gates related to the 12 tribes. And then the foundation stones related to the apostles. And then, of course, Jesus is the cornerstone. But what is, I guess I'm wondering why... The apostles related to the foundation stones, and can you comment on what and why the gates the best, for the... Well, the best of my knowledge, I'd say, if uh, uh, you might say arbitrary, I don't I think you could reverse it, it wouldn't make any difference, and God, you know, it, it one way or the other, and did it one way, okay. <laughs> you know. Okay, I was wondering for some reason. I don't see any difference. I do find it fascinating that these gates were made of one pearl. Now, you understand the wall's 200 feet tall. And if the gate was only 50 feet tall, wouldn't you like to see that oyster? <laughs> but that pearl that big. <laughs> big enough to be a gate. Uh, supernatural thing going on there. Uh, uh, precious uh, jewels and gems all through this. You know, reminds you of the old story of a <coughs> guy getting to uh, uh, the pearly gate, you know. I guess that's where we get the pearly gate here. Right? <laughs> the pearly gate. Peter's standing there. He's got a bag with him. What you got in the bag? He opens it up, fills the gold. Peter looks at it. And says, you brought dirt? <laughs> <coughs> yeah. well, that's where this, the New Jerusalem. It's all precious like this. You don't need to bring your own. Uh, God is prepared to the head of 